Welcome everyone. So this is a session that um, the team uh, put together. Uh, basically, the team has been working on PBTS, um, I would say since late last year. I mean, there's a lot of work um, that happened uh, in the past few months. Uh, it's still ongoing uh, with kind of like wrapping up, finishing up. But basically, the proposal based timestamps, as you know, uh, it, it's a different algorithm to calculate the block timestamps among the validators, something that um, um, some chains and some people uh, will benefit from it. Um, I actually am at ETH Denver right now, and I've been talking to some people, and people are getting really excited about it uh, uh, on the prospects, depending on the use case. Uh, this is something quite uh, interesting uh, for them. I, I just met um, uh, Dave from Osmosis. I was talking to him saying this is coming and he was really excited that this is happening uh, right now. Um, so why does PBSD matter? Um, so the, it's, it's basically, right now we have improved reliability for time sensitive app applications. Uh, applications that depend uh, on a more accurate um, time, let's say, like DEXs, perps. Um, uh, Andy, you might want to change your screen because we can just see the the first uh, oh, slide. It didn't change? No, I know you, you put slides to it, but you might just want to like click through the second page. Okay. Yeah. You know, do, can you do you want to share? Um, it might be better if you if you do. Okay, let me see. Uh, I think you can just exit the slideshow. I assume you're in slideshow yeah. view. You can just be yeah. in the normal view. Yeah. Um, and the reason I'm just asking maybe Lawrence because I'm in the hotel right now and I don't know if the internet is, is that good. So yeah, I can do backup. Give me one better. second to pull this out. How are we doing now? Yeah, it's coming. Yeah. Great. Okay. See. Um everyone can see it. That's good now. Okay. Yeah, I think we're good. Okay. So yeah, so um there are many benefits um from from having PBTS. Um people on this call um have a good use case. So the, there's also the the fact that like for uh, like clients um, that rely uh, on, on like the time and block time for for verification, this is uh, improves the the reliability of the block verification, um, and and also the the potential for signature aggregation. That's a an interesting use case that um, this might open up, um, like um, BLS signatures or MPC computations, things like this. And basically it's just a simplified timestamp agreement. Uh, it's it's um, the way that um, the, the current way uh, with B, PB, uh, BFT time, um, and some calculations that you have to do, um, this is a, 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 a simplified better way to do more efficient. Um, I, yeah, I have to, to maybe Go next. Yeah, so basically, currently, um, the way uh, Comet um, cal um, use, calculates the timestamps is, is what we call the B BFT time. Um, so basically, <clears throat> uh, it, it's a weighted mean um, average of the timestamps received from, um, from the validators. So um and and also weighted by by voting power right um i don't know if anybody on the team wants to talk about bft time um but basically um it is the current implementation uh sure i mean we can just briefly go over it just so people have context of what is currently enabled right it's not um BFT time is not like inferior in terms of if you no. existing chains stay on it, right? Um, but there is extra computation uh, that is involved in calculating a like timely timestamp 
um, that's going to be somewhat less reliable or less true to uh, like a like a real timestamp uh, your your system clock. Uh, and so uh, by moving to BPTS, you're also not only are you ending up with uh, potentially more reliable timestamps, but you're also eliminating the extra computation involved in, in calculating those timestamps across the network. And, and yeah, and it also eliminates the fact that um, you need to track the timestamp for each validator, like remove that. So it, that's the use case for the, the signature, signature aggregations, right? Like, so we don't have this timestamp anymore. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone uh, has anything to add on uh, BLS signature ag aggregation and uh, PBTS enabling that, um, or we can talk about that at the end as well and continue. But again, but this is very simple and short. So the vote message in Comet, they have a timestamp. All the fields of a vote message are the same, except for the timestamp that of course is different. So you cannot aggregate the vote message because they have a field which is different and to aggregate something you have. So to aggregate votes, you need the votes to be identical and be signed by different keys, right? So they aggregate. So you keep the same payload and aggregate the several signatures. The fact that the timestamps are non-deterministic, so they are just numbers. Everyone put a different number. This prevents us from, from aggregating votes properly. That's the goal of BLS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is a good segue to the next one. Um, I, I, I would like to add something okay. to what Daniel said. Mm -hmm. So just to, pay, to make it clear, uh, to make it clear. So at this phase of PBTS, we are not removing the timestamps from the votes because we cannot, mm -hmm. because that would be breaking the block format. Uh, block format, and as you know, we are not mm -hmm. able yet. We are yet not able to modify yeah. the block format without forcing. An, up, an upgrading chain to hard fork. And this is something that uh, well-established chains like, I don't know, Osmosis, The Hub, and, but also many others, Secret, I'd say, you know, all these long-standing chains. You know, I don't think we are at the point where we can actually um, require them to hard fork because our new, you know, our new version just yeah. contains a change in the block format. And this is something we will be working on shortly, but isn't there yet. So PBTS is going to be out. You guys can benefit from it, but the, the, the vote, the vote timestamps are, are still going to be there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's just a kind of like an enabler, but it's not, and, and so it open up the doors, but it's not like uh breaking. Um it's it's a good explanation for Sergio. And um so PBTS, uh so the idea is is, is that now the timestamp of a block is assigned by the proposer, right? According to lo the local clock. Um and then um, the validators will accept or reject uh, that um, based on um, some synchrony related parameters. We'll talk more about the, there's more details about um, the concept in the next slides. Uh, yeah, how that's calculated. Yeah, so the, there's this concept of time timestamp time stamp is accept, acceptable and, and uh, Laura is going to go through and explain more about it. For sure. So basically, uh, the API that we're introducing uh, is uh, a message delay and uh, precision uh, value. So uh, the way that we're going to be calculating whether or not a timestamp is, or the proposer's timestamp is timely, uh, is within this window uh, with uh, negative precision. And then we are adding uh, a message delay in addition to uh, the precision value. And so at any point uh, in the receive time window, uh, a proposal will be judged as timely. Um, and so uh, we have also introduced the concept of adaptive synchrony parameters. And so uh, with each subsequent round, uh, we will be uh, increasing uh, the message delay by 10%. Um, so you can see based on just like some recommended guidelines, uh, potentially what that looks like um, uh, for each subsequent round of consensus. Um, and yeah, maybe on, on this, does anybody from the team wants to talk about the, the 
the delay why is in important or uh, I don't know, someone from PBTS the ten percent value it, you mean yeah 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 why, yeah why, why why is that right I can jump in again so the problem of the message delay if you can go back to the previous slides is that it 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 defines the uh, essentially the lower bound of a timestamp. So a timestamp cannot be too old, too, too far in the past. Otherwise, we reject it. The problem is that if you put the message delay to can go to the next slide to a very small value that doesn't represent the actual delay of the network. This means that most of the proposals that we are going to receive will have a timestamp too much in the past because we choose a message delay which is small. This is very problematic because all the proposals will be rejected because the timestamps are bad. And this can halt the network, essentially. And the other problem, of course, is that in order to change the message delay, it is a synchronous parameter. You need a run of consensus. So if you cannot get consensus, how you change this parameter? So the solution here is essentially, as, the, I, as we fail to, to commit a, a block at round zero, we start increasing, slowly increasing by 10% each round, the message delay so that eventually the adopted message delay will be representative. So the message will be received uh, with the message delay, which is lower than the configured one. So these uh, we discussed a lot of solutions to avoid this halting problem. And this at the end was the one we have choose. Andy, yeah. something to say. Yeah, I have a question. So basically, so you you keep increasing until you can um, you can adapt, right? To 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 the and does it so the next round it goes back to the the default value, right? Yeah, that's a very good question. This is like the the, the timeouts in Comet. So the timeouts you set for round zero, and each time you move to a new round, we increase the timeouts by a, a zero by a delta. When you need an, when you start a new height, you go back to round zero, so to the original value. So this happens every height. So it's not, yeah, it's not. Yeah, that's good. Okay. I have a question of why this one is exponential and the original synchrony parameters are linear. That's a good so, question. This is a good question. Actually, we didn't want, so in the case of timeouts, you have two parameters, timeout propose and timeout propose delta. And we increase the linear by delta. Here we could have used uh, the same approach, so linear increasing. But how do we choose the, <laughs> the amount of increasing by round? We could either add a new parameter, but this is super complex for a corner case. Or we can, actually, this is an exponential, but it's a super slow exponential, right? So it's 10% per round. You take around, I think, eight rounds to double here, the value. Seven, eight rounds. So. Yeah, I'm not saying they seem like they're trying to solve the same problem. So I'm not sure which is better. It seems like you um, you have better guarantees with the exponential version. But yeah, it seems to me like they should roughly be have the same logic, I guess. I don't know which whether that means which one needs to update, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so answer, answering that, so yeah, this is something that could, could be changed. I mean, that our design is not really bound to the fact that this is exponential rather than linear, right? So we could we could change that. It's not a problem. The re, the re, as, as, as Daniel explained, the reason we are putting it as exponential is because the exponential is kind of more flexible in the sense that if you say like point point, like, like we didn't want to put the 1.1 as a parameter because as, as Daniel said, it would be like, like more, com I mean, the, it would be more complex for a for a for a problem here that that is extreme. So this will only happen. This would only be a problem if a chain sets some silly values for message delay. If the chain sets a silly value for message delay, this chain holds, and you cannot you cannot even pass a government proposal to change it. And so it's kind of like a, you know this uh, chicken chicken and egg problem. So we want it, and but that, we know that this is a very extreme. So so like I would say this like. Like reasonable chains will never fall into this, so we didn't want want to add more complexity to you know to the parameters we are exposing. And we believed, we believed, but it's probably a feeling. Is there's no like scientific? Uh, we haven't had like the time or or the or the or the energy 
to go explore, you know, the pros and cons of, about arithmetic versus geometric. And so we could change it. If, if you folks believe that, have strong reasons to believe that it should be arithmetic, we can change it. There's no problem. It's just that with arithmetic, if you hard code the 1.1 or whatever parameter you're going to be have there, it's basically, a, uh, it's basically a straight line. Whereas here you have an, an exponential, which means that, you know, like the, the value, the actual value of the 1.1 is less relevant than the delta for the, for the timeouts. I know, it's, I know it's not a very well, you know, it's not like a well thought out uh, explanation. And I insist we are open to changing it if, if uh, you know, if, if uh, you know, folks think that it should be arithmetic. Uh, no concerns. I'd have to think about it for a bit. Um, I have a question on the parameter, the precision and message delay parameters. Are those um, in state or are those sort of off chain in config files, for example? Those are consensus parameters that are set by uh, the like your defaults that you know we set uh, at the config level, but um, updating them will require um, uh, and like effectively an upgrade. Got it. Um, and um, then we 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 believe. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, we still had doubts. So I, I know this is a bit off topic, but. We are aware that for many, many, many years, uh, we've had the um, comet or 10 minute timeouts in config files. I'm, I still have mixed feelings about that decision, to be, to be honest. In O36, which was retracted, all, all, all those parameters had been moved over to be consensus parameters. There was some resistance in the community, so it was not really consensus. That's why we did not forward port that change in 237 when we abandoned O36. So to me, like the controversy is the relevant here should be put on the tender mean algorithm parameters. Why are they uh, config values? You know, for instance, the, the very obvious one is the timeout. This is something we need to do very soon, which is consensus timeout is something that if not set synchronously everywhere, you, you start getting plenty of round ones all over the place. So performance really would be terrible. And so you can only avoid that by convention, by basically keeping kind of control over all the validators to say, no, no, please set this value, otherwise you're screwing up the network. That is not, I don't think that is acceptable. So probably the the, the, the one that is least questionable is uh, consensus timeout, we should move it over. And the others we should discuss. Sorry, I'm getting off, off, off topic here, but basically this is like the, my, my answer to, you know, to, to your question uh, on the PBTS side. Yeah, it makes sense. I think we can solve it all at once. So I think it's fine for now. Yeah, one, one question. Yeah, one question. So, um, that you're talking about the timeouts, right? So, basic on no, you, um, can you go back? Uh, oh, just sure. One? I, I just had a question about. So, you can actually based on the timeout like that you have for the block, you you can you can uh, depend on the value that you set for the message delay, and you know the um, like the ten percent. You 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 kind of like can estimate how many rounds you can have, right? Is it like, because if you keep increasing until to the point, you, you're getting sure that, or you, you, you'll you know, based on some calculations that you, you'll have this many rounds, right? To, to that needs to, in, in that um, uh, timeout for the block. Does it, does it make sense or? Um, I'm just saying. I think there's some dependencies on 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 the message delay. I mean, I mean, to set the a, a good value will, will depend on on the timeouts that you have for the block, right? Which we are kind of like you're saying. Uh, I don't know if it makes sense what the question, but I'm just thinking that this 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 there might be a way to to come up with a good value for the message delay based on the timeouts that you have. Yeah, it makes sense. Both of them have to, you have to base your values from some measurements on your network, right? Some estimates on how long it take to do some processing, and then you can use that information to configure both. Okay. Actually, actually so, I mean, I hadn't ever, I hadn't, hadn't ever thought about it that way, but it's true that measures delay value could be, re whenever we move over the timeout values 
from config to ML2 here, we mo might reuse this value actually for, because it's Yeah, you could just initially, yeah. If it's a consensus parameter, you could just say, um, or like the number of rounds is kind of like dependent on, on the message delayed, right? And and the precision, of course, but so you can you can go back and say, well, this is a good message delay based on the timeout for the block, right? Um, but you can you can just calculate uh, eventually and, and set a good number for now. But eventually, this could even be um, automated in some way. All right, we can move on uh, to the next if you want. Cool. Um, yeah. So I mean, similar to vote extensions, uh, we'll have like a PPTS uh, enable height, um, and this is like a one way uh, change, right? Like uh, upgrading the PPTS is irreversible, um, and you'll need a coordinate upgrade. Um, so yeah, that will be uh, a parameter as well as our uh, our synchrony params to message delay and precision. Um, and yeah, so these are, are again like suggested defaults, um, but I imagine those will uh, be tuned um, on a per network basis. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions or anything to add on this. Um, what what part is um makes it irreversible? I guess this would be my my question. Oh, uh, you mean in terms of like calculating, uh, like um, your upgrade to, like suppose uh, suppose I have like uh, an upgraded height h and and PBTS gets enabled, uh, but I don't know there's like something that goes wrong. Um, like why can't I revert like to using BFC time? What I'm trying to because we we have like a somewhat bespoke upgrade process, so I'm trying to to see if it's uh, actually reversible for us. But I don't I don't really yet understand um, the last point of upgrading to PBTS is irreversible. Like from the point of view of Comet, like what what really makes it uh, a one way ticket? Yeah, Sergio, you might be able to uh, expand on this. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm just thinking how best to to reply. I mean, I have several ways to reply this, but I don't want to be to to sound convoluted. So, okay. So the simplest explanation is we chose not to support it. You know, like when you are building a this from a software engineering perspective, is like you you decide what your requirements are, and we decided or we came to the conclusion that that reversing it was not a requirement. Uh, in the sense that this is kind of like when we go from PBTS, sorry, from BFT to PBTS, conceptually we are basically upgrading to a version that has it, and we want to eventually for all change to to have PBTS. The reason why are we are doing it with this uh, flag, with, sorry, with this uh, consensus param. I think Sergio's frozen. I can give you. Uh much more, I don't know, pragmatic answer to that. Uh, the blocks in P BFT time, so the current PBTS. methods. Sergio? Yes? Yeah, we lost You froze a little bit. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, my, my network has been acting up all week. So, okay, let me, let me try to, to summarize. So um, the, the, the initial intention of this was to make the, I mean, the feature could all, could, well, would well be the, have been defined and or designed or specified and implemented without this parameter and just saying okay when you do a coordinated upgrade everybody by that you know at, at that height everybody st starts doing PBTS and that would work. We decided to make it more flexible for applications to say no you don't not, you don't need to switch to PBTS at that point we allow you to do it later so that you know you first upgrade you make you let it soak for a bit and then basically you activate uh, PBTS. We don't see any reason why you would be like. Okay, we don't see no like we consider the, the the reasons for you know reasons for or use cases for going back to BFT were not uh, compelling enough to to support this. And then the second part of the answer is, if that was the case, if we had to go back to not to, to BFT, that means that this parameter, as you can see, would not be enough because it doesn't contain enough information. 
Remember, this is done in such a way that when you look at the history of the chain, for instance, when you're doing blockchain on, on old blocks, you are supposed to be using the algorithm that was active at that height, right, uh, all the time. And by that, what you have to do is you have to be reading the, 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 the consensus params. So if you wanted to make it uh, to the deactivated, so activated, and then once activated, deactivated, that means that this integer should be a list or you know or a, or a set or something like this, which would make the whole design more more complex just to support that use case. So that that's kind of the the, the reason why. <clears throat> Yeah, Daniel, I think you wanted to add something. Uh, and one, um, one more thing, just one more thing. So there is, though, a way where you can actually change your mind, OK? There is a, a condition when you could change your mind. You might, so, so you might say, I am upgrading at, at height 1,000. Then the chain, so the, there is a governance, and say, OK, so by, by height 2,000, we will be activating the VTS. So you still can change your mind by removing, you know, de deactivating it as long as you didn't reach that height. That is possible. Also with VOR extensions, by the way. So you see, let me repeat yeah. the, the use case. What you, you reach 1,000, you upgrade. You, you At 1,100, you propose 2,000. But then at 1,700, people freak out, say, wait, 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 we're not sure we're ready. You can still pass another government proposal to go from 2,000 back to zero. So as long as you didn't reach the actual height, you still can change your mind. But once you reach that height, you have to stay with PBTS. Yeah, just yeah, to sure. conclude, by, by, yes, it's just required. The validation of a block depends whether we are running PBTS or not. So if you shift from BFT time to PBTS and then shift back, uh, how we are validating the block. So while you, we at BFT time are validating the blocks of PBTS, we have the solution for the opposite. So if you yeah. are in PBT time and move to PBTS, you can validate the, the blocks on there. If you allow to change, go and forward, back and forward, you will need to keep all these ranges. So it becomes super complex, right? So we are backwards compatible, but not forwards compatible. Let's put in like that. Okay. Right. So I, I, I think I think it would be like reversible, but only uh, via hard fork of the application compacting the state but because it's part of the validation rules and um the bft time pbts one is not supported you have to have that step like uh, a non resetting like upgrade no 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 sorry like a non zero height sorry upgrade uh, okay yeah that makes sense thank you oh, 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 you, you don't you don't necessarily maybe, maybe this is I'm, I'm thinking real time so please take it with a grain of salt yeah for sure you would you wouldn't need i don't think you would necessarily need a hard fork you would need you know us to implement an extension of the future so what you're actually suggesting is being able to be reset that means that we would need to come up with like a, a way in a new version to extend this parameter to us i don't know a list of intervals or something like this so that then you can do it you see it's, it's like you're not doomed but in principle, you would need like a more complex feature than the one yeah. we have implemented here. Yeah, I, I think doing a hard fork is is fine. Like not supporting like the like two directions is is sound. Um, like you know, like doing a hard fork isn't great. But also, like this seems like um, it shouldn't be re like the the handling that scenario like shouldn't be resourced to. I mean, it's like your. <laughs> your resources, uh, but but I think it makes sense, like the the, the choice of supporting um, BFT time to PBTS, but not the, the reverse. I just wanted to have the map in my head. So yeah, and I would like I to add that what Lazaro, what Lazaro wrote in the in the in the chat is is a better you know is a, is a better way of wording my the the beginning of my answer. <laughs> so that's basically what I wanted to say, but I think he managed better than I did in the chat. Okay, cool. Thank you. Well, okay, so. Um... Oh, sorry, so, sorry, Lauren, uh, something I wanted to say because this is being recorded. So these um, defaults that you see here, they are preliminary. We have, uh, by the end, if I'm not wrong, by the end of, the, um, of this presentation, we're reporting on our current efforts to find them out. So these are preliminary, yeah? Yep. These defaults, just for the sake of the recording. Yeah, so uh, literally uh, going into the next slide. So 
Uh, these are, I have one, two more slides this, in the next slide uh, from some preliminary QA results um, in terms of the uh, expected message of a network. Uh, I believe uh, this is including um, latency as well uh, in some of the tests, but uh, is Hernan on the call? Oh. No, okay. Yeah, he's he's here. Cannot hear you, Hernan. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Okay, we can do. Yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the tests that you ran, uh preliminary tests that you ran uh for QA for the PBTS feature branch? Oh yeah, I can so yeah, the, the setup for this test was uh, two hundred nodes, the usual uh, setup we use for the, the QA process. So in particular, here we had uh, used uh, latency emulation. It means that uh, we introduce some delays. Uh, we we randomly distribute the nodes in a, like let's say let's say uh, data centers, and introduce uh, some delays between the nodes. Um, and um, yeah, we, we just uh, run the nodes with a constant load of transactions. Uh, what we call the saturation point of the network, which is about. 400 um, trans transactions per second. I think this is uh, the case here. Um, so yeah, we collected some some metrics on, on that. I don't know, maybe so who wants to talk about, another... particular about this, this metrics? This also might be useful. Yeah, I think the previous one is, is better to choose, but I can... Sure. Yeah, so here we are, like is we think there is the time you receive a proposal subtracted by the proposal timestamp. The proposal timestamp should be the time at which the proposal is produced and, and sent to us. So essentially, okay, the, the visualization here is not great, but you have zero and you have positive values and negative values. Negative values here mean that the proposal timestamp is in the future because when you subtract your time for the proposal time it becomes negative, it means Actually, subtract. Yeah. Anyway, the proposals, the values below zero are proposals with timestamps in the future. We don't expect to see that because, of course, if the clocks are perfect, perfectly synchronized, the reception time is bigger than the sending time. This is real time, how it works. But it's fun that this is an experiment in digital ocean, and we can observe that there is some clock skew because you have some values on the negative side. On the other hand, we can see that most of the clock skew that we observe is up to the half of a second. Is the, the the first bucket bigger bucket on left on the left? Let's put like that. So that bucket are values from essentially from zero to half of a second in the future, so negative. So from that perspective, and these are preliminary results, we can say that the clock precision of a half of a second, which is the current default value is a good one. Uh, Andy, then I move to the next. Yeah, so one thing I think we haven't mentioned or maybe made not clear with the, with the PBTS is now that the validators are, um, are voting or accepting the, the timestamp. So it, it need, there's a threshold of two thirds, right? Uh, maybe you can talk about that, Daniel. So even though you might get some negative values, I think in the end that that will not skew because you're not calculating an average or something and it's not weighted by uh, voting power, right? Yes, I think that if you take the first bucket, the leftmost bucket, the small one from minus 10 to minus half, minus dot five, these are proposals that are going to be rejected because they are more than precision negative. So, so the, the difference is less than half of our precision. You see that the, the the amount here is very small, and like Andy mentioned, this should not really impact the, the, the progress of a network. We would like to tolerate one third of the nodes that have not perfect clocks. But also another point we run this experiment without really synchronize the clock. So this also reveals the importance of using NTP or some service in order to synchronize the clocks. I think Sergio wants to say something. Um, not really. I mean, uh, okay. I, so, I agree with all, everything you said. <laughs> so I wanted to say. Go ahead. Yeah, and there has a question. 
Yeah, so I feel like for this one, there should be a negative 0.1 bucket if you're suggesting a precision of 0.1, right? Um, I would suspect a lot of this in the second bucket between negative 0.5 and negative 0 0.025 um would fall into that bucket but it, you can't tell from this graph right um yeah i do have some concerns about the clock skew and in particular yeah the, i guess the the negative clock skew right like in some cases i guess as a um as a proposer you might be incentivized to like uh use the timestamp slightly in the past to prevent this issue from people rejecting your timestamp from being too far in the future. Um, so I'm kind of wondering, you know, like we have, um, we, we adjust the, the tolerance parameters by round um, to adjust for stuff like latency, but for clock skew, we're not adjusting for that right now. Um, so it seems like pretty aggressive to use 0.1 currently, I think. Yeah, like I think by default, every, everything in the cloud, like DigitalOcean, AWS, and stuff like that does have clock synchronization, but um, a lot of the times those aren't like, so it, the clock should stay like in sync. Like if it drifts, then it'll like set it back to the correct time. I think that's pretty standard in most uh, cloud services, but the accuracy of that like initial setting or every time it resets is actually not that accurate. I think it's probably like, you know, AWS, I think, had it up to like 0 0.4, 0 0.5 seconds accuracy um, recently. And I think they're changing the standard to be more accurate to be within like 0 0.1. But I kind of think that like 0 0.1 is a bit too aggressive in this case. And I'm wondering if there's other ways to prevent, like in the past, right? If you had someone had clock skew, it would just come out in the wash because of the medianization thing. But in the case that they literally can't, you know, uh, get a block approved, then that's a little bit more of a disastrous situation. So I'll just stop there for now. Okay, guys, can I, can I take this, uh, you know, answer this? There's two things I wanted to say, Brandon. So the first one is you mentioned, so you guys have provisions for relaxing the message delay, but not the precision, right? So the answer to that is that in order to fix the precision, all you need to do is to properly set your clock, like start your NTP daemon or whatever. You don't need you don't need the chain to fix that. So if you, there is a chain hold because too many people are skewed, all you require the people to do is just basically to, re to correct their clock, and then then the, the network basically will you know will spring back to life. Whereas for message delay is not that simple. For message delay is that if you should set a message delay which is too too small, there's no way on earth you're gonna get a, a proposal accepted, and therefore the chain will hold. And the only way you have to change the message delay is basically via the chain by passing a govern, govern proposal. So that is, the, that is why we added something for the message delay and not for precision. And then the second one is, uh, I would like to uh, to say, to, to state a little bit of the context of this. So this is something we obtained uh, 20 minutes ago. So this is really hot out of the oven. And I just wanted to share with you folks, there are things we need to, like for instance, uh, the bucket size that uh, Brendan, you, you mentioned. Yeah, so we are actually planning Again, this is super recent. We just decided we we're going to run this again with much more uh, granular buckets to get a better idea of the distribution. And uh, and then with that, it will allow us first to get accurate uh, proof, sorry, a harder proof of what precision measure delay should look like as default parameters, and also what should be the bucket, what the bucket should be, because then you can see the whole distribution. So you can see, okay, so let's put the buckets this way. So this, this is something we haven't done. This is the first iteration. Second iteration is coming probably later today, but you know, <laughs> it's uh, you know, it's the point in, in time we had this meeting. And uh, there was another thing I wanted to say. Um, oh yeah, and the, the negative thing. So the negative thing is to say, this is like, again, we discussed this for the first time half an hour ago, and we need to go there and see, you know, like uh, what, what Daniel explained is our current hypothesis. Our current explanation about that, but we need to go there and see what's going on with the clocks, with DigitalOcean, and also with our latency emulation. This is the first time we have been using uh, Hernan, Daniel, uh, keep me honest here if I'm not saying the right thing, but my understanding is that this is the first time we are actually using uh, latency emulation for something like re meaningful. So maybe there, there is some, some quirk there that we are not aware of it, and, and that might explain why we're getting this negative stuff. Uh, I have a quick follow-up uh, question to that. So, um, so the question. So, let's say if a validator has a really skewed wall time, right, 
in the past, um, that's not really a big issue because we just take the weight of medium, right? Um, going forward, um, it, if let's say my validator is off by like five minutes, then I, my block will always get rejected, right? There's no incentive on the consensus level that actually makes me want to adjust my wall time, want to fix it, right? Like, cause I've seen in the past where um, like, let's say I'm a validator, I just, I'm just not proposing blocks and it's fine because the next proposer will, will propose it and then the network will experience a liveness issue, but I'll still get my rewards, right? So it seems like with this change, there's more ways that a validator can mess up and then just like creates live, live, liveness issue for the network. So I was wondering if there's any plan at all on a consensus level to have some punishment for for proposer. Yeah, I can tackle this. So first of all, replying the standard value of precision and the recommended value of precision is half a sec at least. So 500 milliseconds. I think there was a typo on there. Because in particular, there is a phenomen, uh, phenomenon called leap second. I don't know if you're aware of it, but in order to tolerate that, you need at least half a second of... Uh, this is a thing that happens every X years, but this is a good value or a recommendation. So use at least half of a second, 500 millisecond as uh, precision. So probably the, it was wrong on the, on the slide. Uh, regarding the, the last question, I think it's a very good, good one because we are talking about here the, the, the incentives, the logic, the, the incentives you have to use good or bad timestamp, right? And regarding punishing proposers, I think it's an idea that we already consider, but in particular for this case, it's very hard to distinguish between a proposer that on purpose is changing the timestamp of a block and a proposer, for example, that has very bad latency. So the proposer is in Tokyo and the rest of the network is in the US, right? So it's, it's when you put synchrony in the middle, it's very hard to distinguish between bad behavior and slow behavior, right? So it's, it's also hard to, to produce uh, an evidence of that. So an evidence is, is something that needs to be self-contained and self-verifiable. And when you put time in the middle, it becomes very hard. Sorry. Actually, it is very good. I would just like to rehash what you just said with a metaphor, OK? So to assume BFT time. So assume this, this doesn't exist. This PBT doesn't exist, right? So how do you distinguish right, a proposer that is just basically modified their code to just not propose, just keep proposal? Because I don't know, it's, it, in that chain, it takes a lot, uh, a lot of computing resources. And so it's just basically not proposing, right? How do you distinguish? In that chain, how do you punish that, that guy that is actually not proposing? It is impossible to show or to prove that the guy is not doing it because it might be that their proposals are always coming late, late in the sense that uh, other other guys timed out, right? Timed out, the time of propose went off and so somebody else go, went on and proposed and then somebody that proposal of round one is gonna be taken. So, you know, since we are in a, in a, in a sync or partially synchronous system, there's always this thing about, and this is an impossibility, I mean, it's, not, it's well known for decades, right? But it is hard to distinguish, or impossible, sorry, it is impossible to distinguish somebody that is slow from somebody that is Byzantine. And slow meaning the, the guy itself or the network. Um. It isn't from the application level, isn't there any incentives for the block proposer, like in rewards and things to propose blocks? Uh, so if, if you get additional incentives, I mean, and if you're missing block, like to be a, a chance of being a proposer, then you might get an incentive to fix the clock, right? Um, I don't know if that makes sense. The, 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 my take on that is what, just to, to quote what Brendan said on the chat, like probably, yes, that might make sense, but that's basically up to X slashing. So that's probably up to the SDK to come up with a way uh, to enforce that at the SDK level. Remember, we are just producing evidence. We are not slashing anybody for anything. Yeah. It's actually the app that is, is, is taking care about the information we, we provide in terms of evidence or other behavior to slash. Uh, and, as, and as Daniel said, it is impossible to cryptographically prove that somebody didn't do anything in an asynchronous system. So if you want to, we should wrap this in a while. Happy that. Uh, if you take the 
left right part of the graph here we are taking, talking about positive values and the important point here you have most of the message that have essentially if the value is positive and assuming here that the clocks are kind of synchronized and we are assuming that the message delay is the positive part here so you can say that most message delays in this experiment are between 100 millisecond and 500 millisecond which is the bucket which more values here. We have some values of between uh, half of a second and one second, less value between one and one and a half. And we also have a lot of, of values between zero and 100 millisecond. So based on these data, I think one can say that two second is a good value for this network, for this setup, for the message delay. And the point is that this data, this metric is something we are offering, not only for PBTS, but also for chains that are running BFT time that upgrade. So it's good that you can have the same view of the distribution of the delays between the proposal timestamp and the receive the, the, the time you receive the timestamp. And I think from this data, from this metric, we are going to improve the buckets. We realize that some buckets doesn't make sense. For example, the first one on, on the negative side. And this provides a good indication which are, uh, for which are the safe uh, values, for example, for message delay. Regarding the question of uh, adaptive message delays, assume here that you put the message delay to 100 milliseconds. We have a very big portion of the message that will never be delivered in, in less than 100 milliseconds. So you are going to reject all these messages. And you have the problem. So the problem here, we are adapting a little by little, 10% by 10% until we realize, okay, this is a good latency. And again, we have the possibility afterwards when updating the consensus value to have observed the network and have some real data uh, on each to base the choice of, of your consensus value. So here, based on this data, we we'll say two or two and a half seconds of message delay and half a second for precision are good values or safe values for this network. If you have any questions or some other information you want, uh, you are available here. Yeah, I think just for the sake of time, we could just maybe move on to, I think uh, Lauren had some um, couple more slides and then we can always uh, follow up with on the questions on the channels. This is really it in terms of just like QA results and then where we are in terms of like the development phase. It's pretty much feature complete with the exception of uh, the adaptive synchrony params that's still in review. Um, and then of course, QA is ongoing. Um, so uh, really that's it. So we can continue, but there's not, really not much to add. Folks, any questions, comments, inputs? Um, so to me, like the biggest takeaway is, the two biggest key takeaways are the discussion that is going on in the chat, which is uh, how do we make sure that uh, uh, validators are incentivized to synchronize our clocks, one. And the second is, was the dilemma between uh, linear or geometric or arithmetic or exponential. Uh, so for me, to, that's, those are the two key, key, way, key takeaways. We might rediscuss that internally. And uh, if you have further input on that, uh, we would appreciate it. And I think um, as Matt Sergio mentioned, the QA process is ongoing. This is very preliminary results. And I think like maybe by next week or end of this week, I think things will be progressing a lot more. So we might get more interesting results that we can also discuss and, and, and go over them um, in a later time. Um, without making demands of the all time now, so feel free to address this as sync, but um, Brendan um, brought up something that I found was interesting about F plus one cabals and VFT time. Um, the context around this is like, oh, if I have F plus one malicious 
uh, stake, I can uh, set the BFT time timestamp arbitrarily for in the future or like just mess with it. Um, so I think the advice is our oh, application should have like some sort of synchrony check um, that check that like the, the timestamp is within parameters. For us, it's one of the main reasons we kind of shied away from using um, time, like just switching to time-based mechanisms and instead like use block time and things like that. However, like that's something like obviously like GPTS seems to unlock. So it would be really great to, um, I think, to have more analysis from from experts on um, basically like is this factor like patched? Like it seems that it should be, but having like more like a, a, a sort of like yeah analysis that we can read and, and understand and, and uh, uh, proofread if necessary about like, oh, why this is like, why like now um, just having a little bit over of like the, the malicious stake threshold won't snowball into like being possible to corrupt the application state and the application's perception of time um, would be really, really great, I think. I think I agree. Uh, j just some some high level thought on on F plus F plus one Byzantine nodes is that you know over the you know the, over the months or, or over the years, I've realized that basically there are many things that go. I mean, you cannot you cannot consider normal a chain with F plus one Byzantine nodes. There are many things, many bad things that can happen there. Many many many. I mean, I don't I don't know if I would put any any of my dollars in a chain if I think I have the the feeling that this chain might have more than F plus one Byzantine validators. What do you think, Daniel? Yeah, I think you have much more pressing problems. You have more than than one third of, 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 of Byzantine validators. But I was reading here, I think it's a good point to, to make. Probably it's not clear from the, 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 we didn't present like that, but BFT time, you can only tolerate one third of the process being Byzantine. If you have more than one third, like you discussed in the chat, you can have the time corrupted. In BF in PBTS, sorry, sorry, you need to have more than two thirds of faulty process in order to corrupt time, because a time is only accepted if two thirds of process consider the block type, right? You have to consider that f of these or one third, okay, they accept anything, right? But you still have one third that are correct process that have to accept the time, have to check the time. So in order to, to put arbitrary times that doesn't respect its boundaries, you need more than two thirds of the network being Byzantine or having a very, very bad clocks. I mean, the synchronized clock. So, the, so you're increasing a lot the degree of, 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 of fault tolerance of the algorithm by replacing BFT by PBTS, BFT time. Yeah, that that's that's my understanding as well. Uh, and just on the design, I guess point is, I, th I think it's a really good design goal to have that, um, just like, like the threshold to cause really bad, really hard to detect failure is like as high as possible. And it feels like this is what PBTS like achieves, at least my eyes. And um, and I agree, like it it is baked in that like oh like we tolerate as much as like F amount of failures, but um, if there are like sort of like ways to increase this, this is like always, always really good. And um, the, the thing I found spooky about PB, BFT time is just like it without a synchronous check at least, but it feels like hard to detect and m like a lot worse. We're, we're kind of like safety maxis and uh, like liveness is, is important obviously, but because we have like a shielded pool and um, it's hard to just do upgrades about private state. Uh, preserving like those invariants at the application level are like just this is the mission critical thing for us. Just as a, as a data point, uh, Daniel, maybe you can complement because it's, you know, my memory starts failing with age. Uh, but in the beginning of 2022, when this was first implemented in 36, I remember that William, so one of our, our colleagues at the time, he went out, I think, to osmosis. I'm not, I don't remember if it was the hub of osmosis. And then basically he, he started gathering data on how blocks were synchronized for each of the validators that were running that 
I don't exactly know how he did it. And but I remember that the output was that they were like out of all the validators, it was like one or two that had a very, very bad like like off by I don't know, 10 seconds or something like this. And the, the rest of them apparently they were always using NTP and so they were using like pretty much synchronized clocks. And at the time everybody was of course using DFT time. So it was like kind of like a reality check, right? Yes, yes. We we measured that on existing chains. We didn't do the, this time these measurements of, of of precision, and there are some some guys which and also some validators that are run by I don't know my companies that are so pay attention to have clocks synchronized, and these of course improves. Notes so that having synchronized clocks will improve also the timestamp produced by BFT time. Right, it's not required, but we will improve. And in the case of PBTS, it becomes really essential. I think we uh, we can follow up. We can have additional discussions. Like I said, um, um, I think Adi put in the chat. We have uh, other community calls that we can continue on this, but we can also um, would be happy to uh, be talking to async uh, through Slack too. Um, so we'll follow up. Um, I, I think the this is a great feedback um, that we got. This is the first time. Uh, I mean, the, the the work has been ongoing, and uh, we've been getting feedback. But this is this is like now that we're presenting. This is a very valuable feedback, and I think um, these discussions are quite important. Um, so we'll yeah. follow up. Okay, go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, maybe uh, after we sync with the SDK, it might be worth like a, we can do an async upgrade, but if enough people would like another uh, iteration of this, we can certainly host that yeah. as well. Yeah. Unfortunately, this meeting, I think, had a, a little bit of a conflict with the SDK team, but uh, they asked us to record and they're probably going to be watching this uh, session too. And then we'll, uh, next time we, we can also probably have um, uh, them on the call too. Cool. All right. If no one has any other questions, then I guess we can uh, end the call. Uh, and uh, thanks everyone for for making the time. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Take care. Okay. Have a good day. Bye.